Thanks for tripping in, everyone. Okay. So the webinar, as you can see, is called How I Made Millions as an Affiliate Marketer. And what I'm going to do is basically tell you quickly who I am and what I did, and then I'm going to take some time to explain in much more detail how I did it, and I'm going to do a couple case studies of websites I've started. And the goal here, just so people know, I'm, I'm not selling anything. I'm not pushing a seminar. You know, I, I do have a book, which is like 11 bucks. I'm not making any money off that. So really, the reason I'm sharing is because enough people have asked me about my story and thought it was interesting that it seemed like this would be ideal for the shoe money crowd. So with that, uh, whoops, okay, here's my, <laughs> yeah, everyone buy the bathrobe millionaire and uh, do it on Barnes and Noble because if enough people do it there, um, it'll end up in the stores. So thank you. Okay, that's that's my pitch. So first of all, who I am, um, I'm a I'm a pretty ordinary guy. I'm I'm the only entrepreneur in my family, and I come from an extremely risk-averse family, and that includes me. I'm just one of these guys that gets a visceral sense of, of dread if I spend money and don't get a, a fairly immediate return on it. So my start in the Internet, back in 1998, I worked for a lead generation company called AutoWeb. Uh, they did you know, on, online automotive leads. I started an affiliate program for that company, and you know, I was a kid in my 20s, uh, you know, making sort of a normal salary, and I was sending out these checks for 20 and 30 grand a month to some of the super affiliates, and I was jealous. I thought, man, these guys have the life. They're sitting around in their PJs. I'm sending them way more money than I make, and, you know, I, I definitely wanted to do what they were doing, but I had no idea how because back then in the late 90s, it was really they, there was no solid ways of getting traffic to your website. Anyone could build a site, but there was no Google. There was nothing, yeah, there was no Facebook. So that said, I, I was entrepreneurial. So I actually started four companies, and the first three of them hit the skids. They all, they all went down the tubes, which was pretty uh, discouraging. And with each one, I became more risk averse. So I risked less and less of my life savings on each one. The first one, I put in about 50% of my life savings. On the last one, the one that made millions, I risked only 300 bucks. So there was definitely an inverse correlation. Um, and then nowadays, in addition to doing affiliate stuff, I also broker websites. And some of you may have seen a guest blog uh, on Shoe Money this week about how to, how to sell your website. Okay, another thing, I have no tech skills. I don't know the difference between PHP and .NET. I can't program a simple HTML website. I, I know nothing, and that's very little exaggeration there. So I've learned to communicate effectively with developers and designers because if you're a complete know-nothing like me and you don't learn to communicate effectively, you're going to get taken. I mean, you can spend any amount of money building a website, so you have to learn how to do it cheap. And then the final thing, personality-wise, is I'm opportunistic. So I don't sit around trying to think of million-dollar opportunities. I wait for the opportunities to find me. I wait until an idea is so viable that I've got no choice but to, but to try it. And in a few minutes, I'll get into how I determine if something is viable. So, okay, what, what I did. Why, why did Jeremy think I was worthy of doing a webinar? Um, I told you I started four companies. With my very first one, I raised money from venture capitalists, and I raised over 10 million bucks. In the course of a year, I unceremoniously pissed away $10 million. And that's not easy. I mean, try, try it. You've got to be spending a lot of money every day to blow $10 million bucks in a year. At the end of the year, I had nothing to show for it, and that was really depressing. So based on that, I created a new strategy uh, for online wealth creation. And basically, I reversed everything I did with the first company. So I ditched the hype. I no longer cared about impressing people with my business. I ditched the business plan. You know, what do I need 10 pieces or you know, 30 pages to tell me what to do? Really, I can just follow the money. I ditched having an office. I ditched having a phone. I just used my cell phone. I ditched being social, um, which is kind of weird, but I, I kind of hit underground for, for a, a while, you know, meaning I kind of hung out at, at my house a lot. Um, I cut out the noise, the promotions, the web surfing, and really I focused laser focus on one thing, which is the bottom line. I decided for any websites I start, I'm in it for the money. I'm not in it to change the world. 
I want to make money. So what resulted from that was I started an affiliate business that generated over 15 million bucks in revenue over a four-year period, and it left me with over nine million in profit before taxes, um, which in itself I know it's pretty unusual for affiliates, but I know there are affiliates who've made more than me. I think what makes my story unique is my sites were profitable from the very first day that I launched, so I didn't have to do a bunch of wondering, you know, is he, is he going to get there? Um, another thing is during this time period, I literally worked for 30 minutes a day, no exaggeration. I could not think of things to do during the day, um, so I went snowboarding a lot, I rented a lot of movies, um, yeah, I went jogging, and then the other thing is I never had any employees, so most of the time I had one developer on contract who kind of helped me with stuff, but other than that, it was it was kind of a singular effort, and that's what I think made the story you know different than other affiliates who have done well. So with that, let's go right into how I did it, with the assumption that people on the line, you know, might be interested in doing something similar. And of course, I'm not making any promises that you can go out and make a million bucks, but I think I do have a couple ideas that will help people hone in on how to do this and if you want to be an affiliate marketer, what are some of the right ways and what are some of the wrong ways. So whenever you know, it's time for an affiliate idea, um, I, I'm pretty selective. I, I wait for the right idea. And you know, it's hard to know what's right and wrong, so I've, I've developed some criteria that I use for myself. So one thing is if I can't stop are, are we still there? Okay. Um, well, one thing is, if I can't if I can't stop thinking about the idea, that you know at least gets it on the drawing board. For for me, I find ideas pop into my head everywhere except at my desk. I'm the least creative person from nine to five, but I do really well when I'm out and about. If I'm jogging, if I'm sleeping, if I'm in the shower, um, you know, literally, I've had ideas in my sleep. I, you know, I wake up, I write them down, and those have, have led to big money. So that, that's step one. An idea that I can't get out of my head makes the drawing board. Okay, so the next thing is pretty important. There are you know, virtually unlimited verticals uh, for affiliates. And for me, I've, I've realized my success has come when I've tackled markets that are either growing or relatively untapped or both. So I, I made a big mistake in, I don't know, 2009 or 10, something like that. I decided to be an affiliate for automotive leads. And I, you know, I'm mainly a lead generation person, but I think a lot of this applies to any kind of affiliate program. And the problem is with the automotive vertical, it was totally saturated, totally mature. People had been doing it for 10 years. Um, and I, I lost my shirt. I spent 15 grand on a website and had to shut it down because I couldn't get traffic. So that helped me cement, you know, my, my way of thinking. So some of the successes, you know, I got into the real estate vertical in 2003. Looking back, that market was definitely growing, and it was pretty obvious at the time. It was relatively untapped at the time, um, which one of the ways I gauge that is if I go to buy domain names and I can actually find ones that I like, that means the market may not be completely saturated yet. In 2009, I started a website for unemployed people, um, and it it seems funny to think of unemployment as a market, but you know, think of the you know af after the financial mess of 2008, the only thing growing in 2009 was unemployment. So I thought, okay, what a great market uh, to tackle. In 2010, um, I realized there was a, a growing and relatively untapped market for website brokering, so I built a cal a calculator site to help people figure out what their website is worth. But the point is, what all, all of these successes had in common, either a growing or relatively untapped market. And then finally, I'm not going to start a site unless I've got a good idea of how to effectively monetize it. So, you know, it's interesting. I, I see all these ads, you know, we'll get you more page views, more unique, uh, more unique visitors, more followers on Facebook uh, or on Twitter, more likes. I don't care about any of that. My, my metric is dollars. So unless I can translate all that other stuff into dollars, I'm not interested um, 
because you know one one thing I admitted to myself early on is yes I am in it for the money and as crass as that may sound it you know with my first business I you know I bought into the hype I was like oh I'm I'm out to change the world I want to do something different and it made no money so when I finally admitted yes I want to make money that's when money started to flow um okay so th th those are kind of the first steps of what's the right idea Having an idea for me isn't enough to warrant uh, going to market. The next thing I, I do is determine, do I have a competitive advantage? Because if I don't, I'm going to get crushed. So I'll ask myself certain questions and, and, and try to be honest about whether I'm going to do better than other people trying to do the same thing. So for one thing, I, I, I might ask, can I get more traffic or cheaper traffic? Um, you know, if you know, if I were an SEO SEO guru, which I'm not, or if I had a huge email list, uh, which I do, but I don't touch it, um, you know, that might that might be a good source of traffic. Um, this is where my real expertise is. Can I get better conversion rate? So th this is an interesting point. I see a lot of people that put all their focus into getting traffic to their website, but once people get there. They've got a standard offer that they found on Commission Junction or Zoogle or something like that um, where they're sending people from their website to, to an advertiser and pretty much if you've got the same interface that everyone else does, your conversion rate is likely to be pretty darn similar to everyone else's. So for me with most of my sites, um, I was able to improve the conversion rate of visitors into leads dramatically um, by doing a couple things. So uh, for one of the biggest things I did was early on I would fight with my advertisers and I, I would insist on form posting. And what that is, is the advertisers would say, okay Jason, you've got cool websites, why don't you link over to us, send your visitors over to our, our site to fill out our lead form and then we'll pay you. And I said, thanks but no thanks. What I'm going to do is capture the lead on my own website and then send you the lead information, the person's name, phone number, etc., through some sort of an XML feed or some other type of a feed. The reason that that was so important is by, by having the visitor fill out the lead form on my own website, I was able to do a lot of testing and tweaking and over time on my real estate sites, my initial conversion rate was that I'd get about two leads out of 100 visitors. After I'd done a bunch of testing and tweaking for six months, I got that up to nine leads out of 100 visitors. So that, you know, if you, if you increase your conversion rate four and a half fold, um, you've got more money there. You can spend more on out advertising. You can outspend the competitors. And by doing that, I didn't have to tell the advertisers what I was doing because it was on my own website because I always had this fear <clears throat> that if I did something phenomenal, uh, they were just going to tell all their other affiliates and next thing you know, everybody's doing it and I no longer have an advantage. Um, and when we get to the case studies, I'll, I'll get a little more specific on some of the things that worked. Um, another uh, source of potential, com whoops, potential competitive advantage is to have better relationships. So the way that, that these helped you know, I had one advertiser who, yeah, I had a great relationship. Uh, you know, we, we hung out. We both lived in the Bay Area. Um, you know, I would send, you know, Christmas gifts, whatever. Uh, his company came out with a new program, and they invited me to be one of the first affiliates. That program alone led to almost a million bucks in profit over the next couple of years, and it was because of the relationship. I had another advertiser who was on the East Coast. Um, they, you know, I, I had great relationships with them. I always return their calls promptly, that kind of thing. They actually flew me out to their office and told me one day that they were dumping all of the all of their other affiliates for a certain program, and they were only keeping me. And yeah, you know, that kind of thing doesn't happen without making sure that the relationship with the affiliate manager and with the advertiser is, is up there, and that you you know, that, that, that I let them know that they can trust me, I'm not going to compete with them, I'm always going to be an affiliate, I don't have ambition above being an affiliate, and it, that led to some great things. 
another potential source of competitive advantage, pricing power. So kind of blows my mind. I'll see people say, okay, I'm going to be, an, you know, for the sake of argument, we'll say I'll be an Amazon affiliate. You know, as an Amazon affiliate, you're getting paid, I, I guess, probably 5 or 6% for every sale. Now let's pretend that, you know, it's time to go advertise on Google and, you know, you're advertising directly against Amazon. Well, they're making 14 or 15 percent per sale. If the affiliate is making 5 percent, the affiliate is doomed. There's no pricing power that, you, you know, you're going to get smoked. So for, for me, I always make sure that I've got some sort of a competitive advantage before I embark on an idea. If I don't have some sort of advantage, then I, I do nothing. I skip the idea, um, which, you know, it, it, it's, it hurts to uh, not follow up on something I think might be good, but having had enough failures, you know, I kind of learned my lesson. Okay, not, another important thing. I think most people would agree that having a good domain name is important. Um, the question is how to, how to get a good domain name. So for me, I'm, I'm not the kind of person to go out and spend five or 10,000 bucks to buy a great .com from someone who already owns it. And as most of us know, you know, all the great .coms seem to be taken. So <clears throat> what, what I'll do is I'll sit there in front of GoDaddy and I'll brainstorm domain names that, that are relevant for whatever idea I have. Most of the ones that I like are not usually available, but I'll switch up the words, I'll put in dashes, I'll put in you know, other stuff, and eventually, usually I can find five or ten that are available. One tip is, if a domain name I like is not available, I'll try putting an, a lowercase i or a lowercase e in front of it, and a lot of times, boom, now it's there. So for instance, you know, if I wanted to buy shoemoney.com and it wasn't there, available, I'd, I'd try eshoemoney.com, and I, I bet I could buy that one. <laughs> Sorry, Jeremy, I, I bet you someone's Someone's out there right now <laughs> about buying that. So, yeah. Yeah, so th th there's always ways to, to play with it. So then the next thing I'll do, back in the old days, I'd set up a Google AdWords campaign, and I'd run two identical ads but with different domain names and let the market tell me which one was the better name based on the click-through rate. Nowadays, Google gets kind of funny when you do that. So... Um, a, another good way of testing a domain, what I'll do is I'll take all 10 domains, I'll put them in an email to 20 or 30 friends, and I'll, I'll write a really simple question, like, if you were in the market for X, you know, wh whatever the product is, which domain would most likely catch your attention? And I've done this a couple times, and the results have often surprised me. Um, the names that people choose are often not the ones I would have instinctively chosen, which is kind of the point of the exercise because <clears throat> it's really important to let the market decide what's a good domain name as opposed to my own emotion. Um, be, you, you know, because you know, I, I, as, a, as a human, I get attached to my own ideas even if they're not good. And one thing you'll notice down at the bottom, Bathrobe Millionaire, uh, that's the name of my book. It wasn't my first choice. I emailed uh, a bunch of people, and that's the name that overwhelmingly um, people thought would be a good name for the book. So again, I let the market decide as opposed to my emotional brain. Okay, so now, so at this point, I've determined my competitive advantage. I've determined that I think something's a good idea. I've gotten the domain name, but I've got no idea whether this is really going to work or not. So the next step is I've learned to build out initial websites very, very cheap. So for anyone who's got technical skills, that's great. You, you can build a site for free. In my case, I've got no technical skills. So I've gotten to the point where if I, if I want to get a site done, I'll, I'll uh, hone it down to a very simple version 1.0 that has virtually no features. And the whole point of it is, you know, one, can I drive traffic to the site? And two, if people get there, will they click around and do whatever activity it is I, that I think is going to make, make me some money? Um, since I do lead generation and since I do form posting, you know, building a form post deal can take, you know, a week or two and take a lot of a developer's time uh, because you have to interact with the advertiser that you're selling the leads to and, um, 
you know, there's just a lot of testing and, and that can get expensive, you know, for me. So instead, I'll build these dummy sites where I'll put up a site, you know, sake of argument, we'll call it jasonstestsite.com, but it, it would have a domain name that I actually like. And I'll build out a lead form. The form doesn't do anything. You fill it out, you hit submit, nothing happens, but that's enough for me to do a test where I'll go buy some, some AdWords, send some traffic to the site, and then I can measure, you know, out of every 100 people that clicked on my ad, how many are filling out the lead form. That'll give me enough reasonable metrics to base some projections off of to decide, okay, I think this idea has, has some staying power, let's put more money into it. So all of this testing so far, you know, usually I can accomplish all this for just a couple hundred bucks. Um, so that way, if the idea does not have any legs, I'm only a couple hundred bucks out of pocket and, you know, it's no big deal. If it does have legs, then I'm going to add features uh, incrementally. I'm going to add them one at a time and very often what I'll discover is all the fancy stuff that I envisioned uh, when I first had the idea, very often I don't need it. Excuse me, I'm drinking water there. Very often I'll discover that the visitors to the site just don't care. All they want is like the one big thing that drew them to the site and that ends up saving me money in the long run. And through all this, you know, it's very important for me to communicate clearly with my developers. I, I let them know, look, you know, I want features A, B, and C, and then I'll ask them, are any of these particularly labor intensive? If they come back and say, yeah, feature C is going to take, you know, 20 hours, I'll say, okay, let, let's punt until version two. Let's just go with the cheap stuff for now. And, you know, surprisingly, a lot of times all I need is the very basic site to make money. Okay, so then the next thing, I've done all this, um, I've got my site, I've got my idea, it's rolling. Now, in 2011, most of us have heard about testing and measuring. You know, it's the concept of <clears throat> you keep trying different stuff on your website, see what works best, and go with that. The thing that I add to it is recording. I, I record everything, and I want to give a quick anecdote, and this is going to date me as a guy who's almost 40. Back... Uh, in the 80s, you know, I would listen to music on my little cassette player. Um, and one day I decided I wanted to learn the words to ACDC's Back in Black. So I kept playing the song over and over. I just couldn't pick up the lyrics, no matter how hard I tried. So finally, I played it, and I would pause the tape every 10 seconds, and I'd write down, you know, what, what the lyrics were. Um, and by, you know, after half an hour, I'd written down the entire song, and to this day, if you got me drunk enough, I, you know, I'll belt it out in a bar somewhere. Um, so it really stuck in my mind by writing it down. So this was the same kind of thing that I decided to do as an affiliate. So when I talk about working 30 minutes a day, this is what I was doing for 30 minutes a day. I, I had a spreadsheet, and I, stu I still do this with my affiliate sites. Now, it wouldn't fit on the slide, so I cut it in, into two, but it was about 40 lines long. And what I would do is record everything that happened the day before, and I was, I was religious about this. So what you can see here, this was January 2005, which was one of my best months ever. So Saturday, January 1st, you can see on Overture, which you know has changed names 12 times since then, that day I spent 248 bucks to get 1,092 clicks, which led to 106 leads, my cost per lead was $2.34. goes on and on. For each of my websites, you know, that I was advertising on Google, I had similar kind of stats. And I had, you know, 40 lines of this. And then at the bottom, I had the equations. You know, my revenue for the day was 20 grand. My spend on advertising was 6600 My profit was 13000 and change. My profit margin, 67%. I also had revenue trends so that the spreadsheet would calculate, you know, how it thought I would do for the month. So by the, by the third day of the month, my spreadsheet was telling me that I, I would make 400 grand that month. It turned out it was actually 500, which was, you know, pretty phenomenal. But the point of the spreadsheet was if something, you know, for one thing, it cemented my website to my mind. It didn't, it, it forced me to think about every website every day. Secondly, if 
something changed, if one of my small websites broke, usually I would spot that on the spreadsheet because, you know, if every day a website generated 20 leads and then for three days in a row it only generated five, odds are something changed and it would prompt me to go take a close look at it. So I really credit the recording aspect with, you know, being the discipline that really made the money. Now, another thing that I was very careful of was to determine a stop loss for new ideas. Now, I, I saw a post on Chew Money a couple days ago about no will. Basically, too many people give up too easily. And I, I want to emphasize that a stop loss is is different from not having will because I, I'm definitely persistent, but I'm also very much willing to admit where I had an idea that I thought was great, it turns out not to be great.